All right. Well, um, welcome everybody to uh, Peter White Public Library. Um, my name is Marty Ackett and I'm the adult programming coordinator for the library and the organizer of this year's Great Lakes Poetry Festival. Um, there are some groups and uh, individuals that I have to thank for uh, making this event and the Great Lakes Poetry P Festival possible. One is the Friends of Peter White Public Library. They pay for all the live streaming equipment. They are fantastic. They give us so much money for so many of the programs. So, um, and um, the Carol Paul Memorial Trust Fund, um, who are, we have some music coming up later in the, um, in the festival on Thursday. So um, we, we have to thank them. They, they pay for all the live music here, which is, uh, which is uh, amazing. Um, and then Travel Marquette, the Marquette Poet Circle, Pyre Publishing, Health and Happiness Magazine, and the UP Poet Laureate Foundation. Um, I just have to say a couple things. There are a couple surveys in the back that I would ask you to fill out. One is for the Great Lakes Poetry Festival. Um, we do receive funding through Travel Marquette, and we have to do things like collect demographic information for them. So that would be very helpful. And also, um, I have another survey back there from the city, uh, city Office of Arts and Culture, and they're conducting a study um, to learn the economic impact of nonprofit arts and cultural events in Marquette. Um, and this data is going to assist them and the library and other local nonprofit organizations to better advocate for services and grant funding. Um, there's lots of surveys out there, but if you've even filled this out before, we ask that you fill it out again because every event you can fill out the survey and it helps out. So those are back there. If you can fill those out, turn those in, that would be really helpful. Um, and then upcoming, um, for uh, the rest of this week for the Poetry Festival. Um, uh, tomorrow night, um, the newly appointed UP Poet Laureate, Beverly Mathern, is going to have a book launch event and reading at 7 p.m. right here in the community room. Um, and, um, and then on Thursday night, we have um, the Voices and Art Unlocked concert reading and reception that starts at 6.30. There's going to be Troy Graham doing music. We're going to have poets uh, reading some of the poems that, uh, that, were inspired, that were inspired by the artwork out there. And we're also going to have representatives from that organization here as well. So um, that's Thursday night. Friday, we are showing the movie Tar upstairs in the Shiris room at 12 p.m. If you have not seen it, it's fantastic. Kate Blanchett's amazing. Um, and then on Saturday at 11.30 in the morning in the Shiris room, we have the um, Teen Poetry Writing uh, Contest Awards Ceremony. So um, lots of great stuff coming up um, for the Poetry Festival. But let me uh, do a little, um, I'm going to tell you a little story. Okay, so uh, um, at, as last year's Great Lakes Poetry Festival was um, ongoing, I was already thinking about this year's um, Poetry Festival and who I was going to invite to read and what kind of events we were going to include. And um, I was only sure about one thing about this festival, and that was that I was going to invite Diane Seuss mm -hmm. um, to be the keynote poet. I, I, that, was my, that was my goal, right? And so I'm thinking all through the Poetry Festival, okay, we're going to do this, we're going to do this. And then Diane Seuss wins the 2022 Pulitzer Prize for Poetry. <laughs> and, I, and, I, and I felt my, like, the chances of me getting Diane to come here and do that, like, um, like plummeted at that point. But you know what? I, I always, um, I always I, I'm foolhardy. So I sent Diane an email, um, like, the week after the last year's Poetry Festival ended, and um, one week passed, didn't hear anything. Two weeks passed, didn't hear anything. <laughs> Three weeks afterward, and I'm sure she had like 5,000 emails from people after she won the Pulitzer. Um, but three weeks, the Friday after uh, three weeks, um, she emailed me back and said she'd love to do this. Um, and um, and uh, it was one of the best Friday night, Friday afternoon emails that I... Mm. <laughs> oh, um so tonight is the combination of um, that uh, very first and um, an ever, ever hopeful email that I sent to Diane uh, almost a year ago. And what you're going to learn um, uh, tonight is that Diane's gifts as a poet and uh, an artist 
are only ma are matched only by her uh, generosity and um, gracious spirit. Um, another example of her generosity and gracious spirit, um, we are going to be sponsoring a three-day chapbook contest, a Great Lakes Poetry Festival chapbook contest in the fall, and Diane has agreed to be the final judge for that. So um, all you writers out there, there's no charge to enter this contest. And um, so um, uh, Diane is, is graciously gonna be the final judge for that chapbook contest in the fall. Um, so let me tell you a little bit about Diane. Um, by, Diane was born in Michigan City, Indiana um, and, and was raised in Edwardsburg in Niles, Michigan. Um, she studied at Kalamazoo College and Western Michigan University, where she received a master's degree in social work. Um, she is the author of six books of poetry, um, Modern Poetry, which is coming out from Gray Wolf Press in 2024, um, Frank Sonnets, I'm sure you've all heard of that little book, um, winner of the um, 2022 Penn, Volk, uh, Penn Volker uh, Award for Poetry, the 2021 Los Angeles Times Book Prize, the 2021 National Book Critics Circle Award for Poetry, and another little prize called the Pul Pulitzer in 2022 <laughs> as well. Um, then she's got Still Life with Two Dead Peacocks and a Girl um, for in 2018, which was a finalist for the National Book Critics Circle Award in Poetry and the Los Angeles Times Book Prize in Poetry. Um, Four-Legged Girl in 2015, a finalist for the Pulitzer Prize. Um, Wolf Lake, White Gown Blown Open, um, and which was a recipient of the Juniper Prize for Poetry and It Blows You Hollow um, for, in 1998. So amazing right um so um she's also a guggenheim fellow um a, she's been a was a writer in residence at kalamazoo college for many years and has been a visiting professor at colorado college the university of michigan's helen zell writers program and washington university in st louis in 2021 she received the john updike award from the american academy of arts and letters and in march of 2023 um, this year, um, uh, Diane was the guest editor of the Poem A Day series. So please, let's give a big Peter White Public Library welcome to Diane Seuss. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. I'm, I wish I was there in the flesh. And um, I'm, I'm really sorry we have to Zoom it, but I'm, I'm here and I'm connecting with you as much as I can. Um, I have to tell you, I just got a rescue dog named Stella, and she's a brat. And as the introduction was just starting, my neighbor brought her back from escaping the yard. So she's here now looking very sullen. Um, I, I just want to briefly thank everybody involved with the, the festival and um, especially the Peter White Library and Marty Ackett, who's such a groovy, groovy host. And I'm so appreciative of uh, his kindness and, and um, warmth. Uh, we decided we have to spend a good uh, evening sometime over some food talking about my time in New York because uh, I think he's curious and and I want to hear about growing up in Ishpeming. Um, I love the UP. It's not my home, but it's my homeland. I spend a lot of time up there and my son uh, lives in good old Mohawk, Michigan, up in the Keweenaw. <laughs> So um, I'm going to get started and I'll read for, you know, enough time that um, you'll hear your, you'll hear some poems without hopefully getting um, bored. And then we'll leave some time for questions and I hope you'll ask as many as you have. Um, so I think what I'm going to do is I'm starting with some poems from Frank Sonnets, and I'm not reading them in the order there in the book, but in sort of a chronological order. Um, and, and let me just explain real briefly that if you've not read Frank, um, it's sort of a memoir in loosely made sonnets, what are often called American sonnets. 
So you might hear some rhyme, you might hear some meter, um, but they're not Shakespearean sonnets, but they're all 14 lines and they all kind of move like sonnets. Um, and so um, I'm, I'm going to read from there. And then I have a, um, a sort of larger poem that's going to be in my next book and it's all set in the Upper Peninsula. And, um, and I, I hoped, I've never read it um, to a, a group in a reading. And so I would be honored to be able to share it with you. So here we go. This is from Frank Sonnet. My earliest memory is telling myself stories without words, starring the decal dog cat and butterfly on my crib headboard. I couldn't talk yet. Then my mother coming in the room to pick me up. I lifted my arms. It must have been my mother, though I've never called her mother in my life. I call her by her name, Norma, and always have. Another early memory is getting lost in a toy store, finding my mother, and encircling her legs with my arms. But it was not my mother. It was another lady, a stranger. And from then on, toys too were strange. The small oven that baked cakes with a light bulb, playing under a mock orange tree, and in the abandoned chicken coop, finding out what I called violets, was really petrified chicken shit. <laughs> I hope there's some laughter. <laughs> um, okay, so this takes a tonal shift and I think you'll see it, it sort of um, characterizes the place where I'm from and, um, and, and this big sort of central early moment in my life. No need to sparkle, Virginia Woolf wrote in a room of one's own. Oh, would that it were true. I loved the kids who didn't. June can't remember her last name tilt of her head like an off-brand flower on the wane, her little rotten teeth the color of pencil lead, house dresses even in fourth grade, and that boy Danny Davis, gray house, horse, eyes, clothes, fingertips, and prints, freckles not copper colored but like metal shavings you could clean up with a magnet. Now, Mrs. LaPointe was a dug up bone, but Miss Edge sparkled. Taught the half and half class, third and fourth grades cut down the middle of the room like a sheet cake. Wore a lavender chiffon dress with a gauzy cape to school. Aquamarine eyeshadow. Sweetie, she whispered to me, leaning down, breath a perfume. Your daddy's dead. Tears stuck to her cheeks like leeches or jewels. You know, I think that poem gets at sort of the, the sparkling beauty of um, of a moment that, you know, you could say, oh, that was a terrible moment, but there was also beauty in that moment and, uh, and value in that moment. And if you're, if you're writers or if you want to write, um, I recommend a, a 14 line poem. Um, because it compresses, you know, you don't have to fill up endless space. And so it compresses um, the work you have to do. You can, you can squeeze a lot into 14 lines. 
and I'll show you that and um, hopefully in a minute I'll, I'll read a poem that really shows that. Um, so this is another sort of young, young me poem. Who wants to be soft? I don't. I've even seen a hermit crab outgrow its shell and drag its perilous softness into a doll's head. Crab, I empathize. As a kid, I fed my big baby dolls barefoot into a rotating fan blade. I wasn't mean, not at all, inquisitive. Doll donated her toe to science. I mixed potions, iodine, nightshade, and some incongruity like a few drops of my dad's aftershave. He was dead by then, but there was a quarter of a bottle of aqua velva in the medicine chest, which I used sparingly. I wasn't planning to poison anyone, even my sister who showed me how to harden up by folding her arms across her chest and scowling at my dad's abdominal tumor. Our mom slammed the door and drove to Lake Michigan. I pictured her making her way into the sheltering undertow. The Reverend Larry Whiteford sang when the gates swing open at the funeral. And the three of us sat there like Mount Rushmore. Anyway, dad was a softy, Jesus a softy. So this one, this one is a little racy. I hope you can handle it. <laughs> <laughs> if I had to, then you can. Labels now slip off me like clothes when I was in the dark with some daddy man. And I could turn anyone into a daddy man with my stupendous mind, which is how I thought about things when I was 14 and some Half a rapist was scraping the tears off my cheeks with a milkweed pod in his two-room house on the riverbank. So many boys back home lived without parents in Fuckerson Park, where some of us teetered ready to tip onto dirt roads, where shacks were painted Kool-Aid colors and nameless pathways led to Bob's Country Club. And all the dogs were named Pee Hole and one big colonial prefab from when the Lord let Rose, led Rose to the right lottery ticket, which wasn't worth the resentment heaped on her by the rest of us. Even Jesus, she said, resented her and smote her that way he does with a thousand paper cuts, which made the rest of us feel better. And that is the job of Jesus, the most daddyish daddy man of all. <laughs> so I was no I was not raised in in a religion. I think my parents were too busy. Um, but um I I sort of intruded on other people's um, churches and I got saved seven times. <laughs> and um, I, I went to catechism trying to convert to Catholicism. And then the, the brother told my mom to keep me home. I was too young to make that decision. But one thing I learned from the Catholics was about the harrowing of hell, which, you know, I wouldn't have heard about otherwise. And apparently, um, so after Jesus's death, he, um, he goes to hell and he kind of messes shit up. 
and then he he brings back the souls who could be saved rescued or restored um so so i took that that um event and kind of joined it up with um the place where i'm from and you'll hear in this poem more um sort of metrical lines and some rhyme. He came to us all the way down here with us. He trod the narrow path to us. He harrowed us. He robbed us of our stuff. And then he bade us to adore the very robber who had robbed us of ourselves. He swept his empty hand across our shelves. He commandeered our dust. He loosed the goats, rejoined the milky mothers to their calves. He cut our drooping fruits and halves, infringed upon our lust. He mesmerized the feral cats and charmed them from the pea marked corners of the barn into god awful light. He strode across our ashes and our blight, the fields we burned to rid ourselves of parasitic worms and ticks. He snared our seeds and jarred our feeble bees. He gathered up our kids, the ones who squeezed their dirty feet into ill-begotten shoes, the brood of meth and thunderbird whose amniotic sacs were tinted blue. He harrowed us, unbarrowed us, he sparrowed us and nailed us. Then he jacked our 7-Eleven and he hauled us up to heaven. <laughs> rhyme can just do a thing that nothing else can do you know it appeals to our bodies not our minds so this is this teeters on a up poem and you'll you'll recognize why i say teeters the problem with sweetness is death the problem with everything is death. There really is no other problem if you factor everything down, which I was no good at when studying fractions. They were always using pi as their example. Rather than thinking about factoring things down, I wondered what kind of pi. And here I am, broke, barely able to count to 14. When people talk about math, they say you'll need it to balance your checkbook. What is a checkbook? And what indeed is balance? Speaking mm -hmm. of sweetness, for a time, I worked in a fudge shop on an island. After a week, the smell of sweetness made me heave, not to mention the smell of horses. It was an island without cars, shit everywhere. <laughs> when I quit, the owner slapped me. It's true. <laughs> <laughs> oh boy. Um, this is an example of what I was speaking of earlier, how much time and space you can leap in 14 lines, and I urge you to try it. The best is when you respond only to the absolute present tense. The rain, the rain, 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 and wind. An iridescent cloud, another shooting, this time in a shopping mall in Germany. So this is why people want other people to put their arms around them. I will walk to the bay where there is a kind of peace, even emptiness. The barn swallows sharp flight and cry. 
who now has the luxury of emptiness or peace? The beauty of thunder in a place where there is rarely thunder. The mind like a jackrabbit, bounding, bounding. My wet hair against my neck. Grandfather's barber shop. The lineup of hair tonics by color like a spectrum. The pool table removed to make room for great grandma to live out her years. My father cutting a semicircle in her kitchen table so it would fit around the stovepipe. Rain, rain, fascism in America is loud. That thing bounds all over the place, you know, from the Bay to Germany to um, the, the jackrabbit to the wet hair against my neck to the barber shop to great grandmother's weird little apartment behind the barber shop and and then um, to this sort of political moment. Okay, so this is for you all. <laughs> this is for Ishpeming and everything that radiates out from it. <laughs> Do you all know where Rapid River is? Yes. Yeah. And Jack's restaurant? Yes. yes. Yeah, okay. Once I took a Greyhound north across an icy bridge. It seemed it took all night to cross that bridge, a bridge lined with stars, unscrewed from the sky and fastened to the cables and the towers with black electrical tape. Bus windows fogged over from all the human breathing, lovers, masturbators, numb frostbit moon going black around the edges. So many stops along the way, boarded up gas stations and stores, caution lights swinging, butchered deer hanging head down from maple branches, crust of ice on blue snow radiant, some hollow-eyed chump embarking from or disembarking into God-forsaken loneliness, which I had come to love, not the lonely ones, but loneliness itself. When I reached my stop on Highway 2 outside Jack's, wild blueberry pie but closed, driver opened the hatch and told me to crawl into the belly of the bus to retrieve my bag. Exhaust lit red when it pulled away. Walked far that night, then through hip deep snow to the shack. No heat but wood. Faulkner and a feather bed. That's your territory. Well, let's let's uh, leap from Rapid River and and where where our shack was, which is Perkins. It got struck by lightning and burned because that's how my life goes. <laughs> <laughs> um, but it was a cool, cool place. Um, so we'll leap from there, from that fire to New York City. Parties among strangers. So I was in New York in the East Village in the um, mid to late 1970s. I left right, right before John Lennon was killed. Parties among strangers, punks, leather caps and straps, pressing quaaludes between my lips. What was pressed in, I swallowed. 
Is it hard for you to imagine me wearing gold lipstick? I did. Is it hard for you to imagine me stupid? I was passed like bread among strangers. For a couple of nights, I was the new thing, then just a thing. Days, I ran a vintage clothing store, sat at a card table with a cigar box for a cash drawer, the place too small for more than a couple of racks of old dresses and tuxedos. Every day, a screenwriter newly arrived from Poland sat across from me, knee to knee, and read from his horrible screenplay. <laughs> Sound fun? He asked, <laughs> he asked for critique, but when I gave it, he derided me, once even spit in my face. I quit the job to get away from him or didn't quit, just didn't show up one day. That's how things worked back then. I was valueless, no? It seems strange now when everyone is so intent on having value. I flitted in my stolen vintage clothes, topless. I was that writer named Anonymous. Okay, so I'm going to assume you know who Tom Petty is. <laughs> Do you? <Yeah. laughs> right. You're like, we live in the UP, not Mars. Um, yeah, so get ready for Tom Petty. There's something to be said for having one plate, one spoon, a fork, a dull knife living out of a red suitcase, eating when hungry, grabbing shut eye when tired. You're high natured, Joyce James said to me when I lived in NYC. We were in a cab on our Friday lunch break going to a record store. Decades later, I see I was not high natured, only wanted love, though what that means, I don't know. Something about mystery, standing humbly at the gate of someone else's mystery and hoping for the sound, at least now and then, of the hinges turning. Mystery now, mystery then, is when I went up to a guy at the record store to ask him who did the song Refugee, and he said, me. And I realized after I found the album and looked at the photo on the cover, I'd ask Tom Petty who did a Tom Petty song when I, <laughs> which I'd heard on the radio when I was hungry and tired and alone. Okay. Um, A big part of the book is um, my son, the, the one who lives in the UP, he's my only kid. Um, and one reason he lives in the UP is um, because he, he experienced a really terrible period of addiction in his life. And luckily lived and um, is clean. But um, I was during that time a single parent. I'd gone through divorce. And um, for those of you who've been through addiction or loving someone who is an addict, um, I think you'll understand um, this poem, um, which which searches, I guess, for a a way out or a way to, to stand um, reality, especially when it's your kid. Where is the drug to drug this feeling out of me? The drug to drug away the fear of drugs and what they steal from me or stole from me. Sometimes love and then my sanity. 
the frozen bowling ball that set up shop inside my gut and liked it there and never went away. I never went away for fear of losing what I left, which was itself a kind of hell. The hell of being terrified of swapping hell for hell. My son fucked up, rolled his car in dark Ohio, lay inside the ditch and listened to the crickets. Even grass, he said to me, he could hear it growing and corn all of it just trying to get by. As close as he could come, he said, to God. And I was such a fool, believing in fruition, stuck inside the fairy tale of resurrection. Even stars, he said, are trying to get by. And then he used for 10 more years and bankruptcy. And where's the melody to remedy the melody? The remedy to remedy the remedy. So um, this, um, this is a, a sonnet that is from a sequence in the book um, in which my son and I, um, have conversations online and he's really hilarious and interesting and smart and um this is an example and and um it comes out of his his need to be in the up to stay clean on what day do you think jesus was actually born he says and do you think Billy Idol is talented but dumb or smart but talentless? <laughs> I love the cold, he says. I love it to be as cold as it can possibly be. I want snow as high as the rooftops, which is why he swears he'll never come home from the north never back over the bridge, not for holidays, like the false birthday of the so-called Lord. Throw out my stuff, all of it, he says. So cold, I can spit and it freezes, makes a ch sound, like Billy Idol pronounces S when he's really rocking. <laughs> Did you see him live, he asks. Did you see the clash? Yes to the clash, no to Billy. I spat and it froze in November, he says. Rare these days. Never home, not for funerals or to sleep in his old room where I used to find empty quarts of vodka, needles, pipes. But he's clean now, clean. Gorgeous word, like snow, like cold. If I were Jesus, he says, I'd make it colder. <laughs> yeah, some of the other poems in that sequence are him talking about Elvis and how I don't know anything about Elvis. And <laughs> um uh and all the impressions he can do, um, which pissed off his girlfriend so much that she broke up with him. <laughs> <laughs> So my mom is, is a great um, inspiration to me in the way that she puts together sentences and, and tells stories. And um, I sort of took one of her phrases and turned it into a poem about the sonnet. The sonnet, like poverty, teaches you what you can do without. To have, as my mother says, a wish in one hand and shit in the other. That was an answer to, I wish I had an Instamatic camera and a father. Wish in one hand, she said, shit in another. She still says it. When she tells me she wishes I were there to have some of her bean soup, she answers herself. Wish in one hand, she says, shit in another. 
Poverty, like a sauna, is a good teacher. The kind that wraps your knuckles with a ruler, but not the kind that throws a dictionary across the room and hits you in the brain with all the words that ever were. Boxed fathers buried deep are still fathers, teacher says. Do without the, without and, without hot dogs in your baked beans. A sonnet is a mother, every word a silver dollar. Shit in one hand, she says, wish in another. I don't think I'm gonna have time to read my UP poem. Let me look. One. I think I won't, but I'm going to refer you. If you um, look online, um, Google the Poetry Foundation and or just Diane Seuss and the poem is called Allegory. And um, think of me when you read it. I, I think I read it on, on there too. You can hear me reading it. So I'm gonna, I'll end with two sonnets, um, a kind of funny one, and then the last poem in the book. My favorite scent is my own funk at least my least favorite scent, other people's funk. And this, my friends, is why we cannot have nice things. <laughs> <laughs> I value the advice I give others, but I don't like the advice that comes my way unless it reflects what I would have done anyway. You know how it goes. I like how my voice sounds in the car when I sing along with earth, wind, and fire but no one else can pull it off, no one. <laughs> My bad acting when I acted was charming. I intended it to be bad as a comment on the state of theater in the 20th century. On days I don't have to see anyone, I don't brush my hair, I don't wear underwear or shoes or chemical potions meant to extinguish my funk. And in these times, I am nearly perfectly happy. If you're me, it's luxurious to go unobserved. When asked the inevitable question, whether I'd wear eyeliner if I was the last person on earth, no, hell no, eyeliner is war. When I'm alone, I lay my weapons down. <laughs> Since I wrote that poem and it's got, you know, been out there in the book, I keep getting gifts from strangers of different kinds of eyeliner, <laughs> which is cool. Okay, this is the last poem. And I'm gonna mention Frank and the Frank of the book is Frank O'Hara, um, a poet who um, was in New York City in the, in the 1950s. Um, and he, he died in a weird way. He, he was uh, loaded and, and got hit by a Jeep on Fire Island. Um, and let's see, I mentioned Mickle, who is a big part of the book. He's, he's the guy on the cover. And he was my, you know, those relationships where you can't really say what the person is that sort of romantic, but he was gay, but he was um, more than a friend. It, it was a complex relationship. And he died of AIDS um, in, in the mid 1980s. Um, and let's see, I mentioned Basquiat, the painter, and, and Whitman, um, meaning Walt Whitman. So you'd probably know all that shit, but I'm telling you anyway. <laughs> <laughs> Here it goes. I hope when it happens, I have time to say, oh, so this is how it's happening. 
unlike Frank, hit by a jeep on Fire Island. But not like dad who knew too long, six goddamn years in a young man's life, so long it made a sweet guy sarcastic. I want enough time to say, oh, so this is how I'll go and smirk at that last rhyme. I rhymed at times because I wanted to make something pretty, especially for Meko who liked pretty things soft and small things, who cried into a white towel when I hurt myself. When it happens, I don't want to be afraid. I want to be curious. Was Miko curious? I'm afraid by then he was only sad. He had no money left, was living on green oranges, had kissed all his friends goodbye. I kiss lips that kissed Frank's lips, though not for me a willing kiss. I willingly kiss lips that kissed Howard's deathbed lips. I happily kiss lips that kiss lips that kissed Basquiat's lips. I know a man who said he kissed lips that kissed lips that kissed lips that kissed lips that kissed, lips that kissed Whitman's lips. Who will say of me, I kissed her? Who will say of me, I kissed someone who kissed her? Or I kissed someone who kissed someone who kissed someone who kissed her. Thank you. Thank you, you guys. Thanks for listening. Oh, all right. Well, um, we have a couple mics up here. So if anybody wants to come up and ask a question or give a comment to Diane, she's really looking forward to uh, answering some questions and interacting with you guys. So please feel free to come on up and um, ask any questions that you want. Please, I beg of you. <laughs> okay. Otherwise, I'll just have to sit here uncomfortably. Hello. Hi. This is a, hi. Um, this is sort of a question, but it's more like I grew up in Dwajak. Oh. oh, right. Did you call it Dog Patch? No, we did not call it Dog Patch. Well, Niles see, I was in Niles called, and we yeah. called it Dog Patch. <laughs> yes. We just called you the fucking Niles people. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I can understand that. Yeah. <laughs> But I guess my question is, is as you're reading the poems, I can, um, I mean, having escaped Southwest Lower Michigan a long time ago myself, but I can still hear so, so much of you still grounded there and yes. you're still mining that growing up in that area. Um, do you ever feel as if you've run out or does it, you know or does that still keep coming back what a great question wow that's one of the best questions i've ever gotten um if you just heard a groan that's my weird dog it wasn't <laughs> um so boy um i feel like um the past especially the landscapes of our childhoods are so rich, at least when I was growing up, you know, the, the, we played outside, you know, we didn't have toys much. There was, was no video and internet, none of that. But there were milkweed pods and cattails and bogs and bullfrogs and, you know, it's the primal images that um, that feed poetry for me. And so it's endlessly rich. And, um, you know, for, for a long time, I sort of hated where I was from and I escaped it to the East Coast, but I returned. I mean, I'm in Kalamazoo now, that counts as Southwest, Lower Michigan. Um, 
my mom is still in Niles, my sister, her daughters. Um, in a way, it's like family members. It's it's who I'm stuck with. It's what I <laughs> it's what I'm stuck with. And you know, I learned at some point that every place is a place. There's no Eden. There's no um, you know hell hole. All places are sort of equal. Um, and you know. I think about Faulkner, you know, writing all of his novels, pretty much most of them set in one little imagined county in Mississippi. And all the dramas of heaven and earth play out in that small space. And I feel like that's true uh, where I'm from, where you're from, where you're standing right now, you know. If you look closely, all of the dramas are there. Um, so I don't think um, I've I've moved from um, sort of more narrative telling and storytelling to um, ingesting those things as images that are just part of my you know, they're in the bag I carry around, my metaphor bag, and they're what I have. So I'm grateful to them. But my next book, for instance, um, you'll notice they're there, but I manage the, that material in a really different way. Um, I won't go into it, but you'll notice it when you, when you read the book. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, I, it's, a, it's a good question. And I don't ever do the same book twice. I don't take the same point of view, attitude, um, relationship with language twice. So I always feel like I need to change it up. But we can't escape the metaphors that we were born to. Thank you. Mm -hmm. So you can't escape dog patch, honey. <laughs> mm -hmm. I have a comment and a question. Okay. I see some real similarities between your writing and and that of uh, Linda Hall. I don't know if you're. Yes, that. that's a compliment. That's a compliment. I love her writing. And the other thing, I was just wondering who your literary influences are. Great question. Um, you know, um, you'll notice if you get my next book that John Keats, the romantic poet is, is very important to me in that book. Each book, I feel like I, I carry a different influence. And in Frank, it was Frank O'Hara who wrote what he called, I do this, I do that poems. So, you know, he was almost writing the poem as he was walking down the street or going to a club or whatever. Um, and so I had this kind of spontaneous relationship with language, it kind of learning from O'Hara. Um, but, um, you know, I have to say that coming up, you know, being a kid, I mean, right after my dad died, I was seven, and and my dad had um, quit high school and, and served in World War II, and um, when he got out, he got his GED, and then went to college on the GI Bill, and became a teacher, and then a guidance counselor, and um, Let's see, where was I going with that? What was I saying? Help me. Influences. Influences. Influ okay, so the day after he died, one of his students brought over the first Beatles album, mm -hmm. um, which in America was Meet the Beatles. And I seriously had the thought, I don't have a dad anymore, but I have this. Mm -hmm. And so rock and roll um, all through the 60s and 70s 
was extremely important to me, music generally, and I think was as big of an influence on my poetry as anything else. Tom Petty, Tom Petty. <laughs> I missed my chance with Tom Petty, but oh well. <laughs> um, uh, so um, in terms of poets, um, you know, when I was, I, I, my, my next book is called Modern Poetry, which sounds kind of lame, but um, that was the first actual poetry class I ever took. It was in college and it was with the poet Conrad Hilberry, who was a Michigan poet and my mentor, he kind of scraped me out of Niles and got me money to go to school. And he taught five poets in that class. And they were William Carlos Williams, Theodore Retke, Gerard Manley Hopkins, who was kind of an outlier, Wallace Stevens. So you'll see there, those were all white men. And starring the woman, Sylvia Plath, who was dead. <laughs> so, um, but I would say, so I have a poem in, in my next book called Modern Poetry, which is about that class. And as limited as it was in its way, I think I still see those poets as really formative. Williams, um, no idea, no ideas, but in things, his concreteness. Um, Wallace Stevens kind of weird imagination and, and writing about perception. Radke, who was a Michigan poet. And yeah, he, so there were three Pulitzer winners in poetry from Michigan, Theodore Radke, Philip Levine, and Lil O Me. But those two, Retke and Levine were long pat, they left Michigan. They were on the West Coast. So I'm the only female and the only one who stayed. I don't know if that's good or bad, but <laughs> <laughs> Retke um, is a big influence because of his interest in the, the muck and the goo of the landscape, the you know, the watershed and the, and the swamplands and, and how he translates emotion through those images. And then Plath was a huge influence because um, I could recognize my, you know, my gender in her. And I mean, she has that poem in her book, Ariel called uh, Daddy. And I mean, it gave me this outlet to really start thinking about my dad and my love for him and my anger that he was gone and all that stuff that I could translate to language. So, and then, I mean, there's a ton of, of people more contemporary, but I wanna say this before we uh, close that question. I. I also think you have to protect yourself from influence. And that is like, I read, but I read really selectively when I'm working on a book. And I think there's, especially because of social media, there's so much of a feeling in younger writers, like um, I have to read everything and be constantly sort of imitating, you know, what other contemporary writers are doing. And I think that's dangerous to our individual um, relationship with language. So I'm a little bit like read, yes, and, but be selective. And also I think uh, for writers coming up, read the old stuff. You know, a lot of my students are like, eh, you know, but then they got hooked. I mean, when you read Emily Dickinson, you know, much madness is divinest sense to a discerning eye, much sense the starkest madness, tis the majority in this as all prevail, assent and you are sane, demur your straightway dangerous and handled with a chain. 
I mean, come on, you know, or um, Keats um, is, you know, I feel like we have a, a really close relationship. I learned from having a, a father who died that you can maintain relationships across the divide between living and dying. And, um, you know, to be able to read the poets of the past, I feel buttressed, I feel supported, I feel held up. And, um, and so I read the old, the old poets and I, um, I learn from them. I always feel humbled in the presence of, of the older poets who, who lasted and they sustain us. Well, we're at the end of our time. I don't want to take your evening, but this was so good. And I, I wish we were all together in the flesh. Thank you so much, Diane. Um, uh, you have made the Great Lakes Poetry Festival even greater by your presence. So um, thank, thank you. you. Thank <laughs> you so much. And I'm I'm so appreciative for those of you who listened and stayed and um, you know, who care about poetry. And thank you, Marty, for for persisting and, and making this happen. I really appreciate you. Well, we really appreciate you. And you know what? When you're up our way, like I said, you give me a two-day notice. I'll find a room and we will have a reading. So and let's all meet. Let's all yes. be together. Yes. Yes, Thank absolutely. You. Thank you so much, Diane, and you have a wonderful evening. And you too. Bye, everybody. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.